So I'm um, combining my, my work here at ICGB with also some clinical work as a, as a cardiology, a cancer cardiologist. And my lab focus uh, more on mechanisms of uh, uh, finding mechanisms of cardiac aging. Um, and also trying to translate these findings in new uh, therapeutic uh, options. So, uh, one, what, what is aging? Aging is an ine inevitable and progressive uh, decline of uh, tissue and uh, cellular function. There are like probably hundreds of theories that are trying to explain what are the mechanistic of aging. But uh, to, to answer quickly, quickly to this question, uh, basically why we do not become immortal, but then we age and die. Probably it is easier to, transfer, to become immortal by transferring genes to our progeny. And that's what, uh, what, what's happening almost in all uh, living species. Although you can see there are like big differences from a mouse that can live up to two years to this guy here, the distal uh, cone pine tree, that can live more than 5,000 years. So one of the theories is basically that you have a, a, a repair budget during your life uh, and you can use it uh, in combination with uh, the expense that you need to reproduce. Uh, reproduction is also expensive, so then once you have uh, reproduced, Basically, there is no need to survive anymore, and you cannot. Uh, you basically, um, you know, you you don't have anymore all these uh, those pathways that are responsible to repair during the, the all the damage that accumulates during uh, during the lifetime. And this can be at, at um, genome level, at protein levels, membrane levels, and basically the end result of this is aging. So how about humans? You, I mean, you probably know that life expectancy in humans has enormously improved, uh, especially during the last two centuries. You can see here that at the beginning of uh, 1900, life expectancy was on average a little bit less than 50. And then you can see these two drops uh, in a constant increase. And these are basically the combination here of the Spanish flu and the First World War and the Second World War here. And now we are, you know, females live longer compared to males, and uh, um, it's uh, 85 for females on average, and around 80 for males. But what we know is that we're probably approaching to the limit for, uh, for the human lifespan. This lady here is Madame Calmant, that is supposed to be the person, the long-lived person in the world. Uh, I mean, at least certified. She died when she was 122 plus 164 days. There are actually some concerns that this lady actually could be the daughter of Madame Calmont that actually was impersonating this lady just to keep getting the pension. So this is the, the you know the latest news. But. Until this is, you know, ruled out, she's still the long-lived person. So we can say that lifespan of, um, of, uh, of humans so far has been like 120, 122 years, but according to some mathematical models, we can probably reach up to 140, 145 years in the optimal uh, conditions. But, but why is it important studying aging? If you see this graph, this is what's going to happen in the next 25 years. You can see here in this um, dark red, the countries where uh, people that are aged 65 or more will be more than 30%. So there will be a huge increase in uh, aging people. And this is, you see here, that this is important for uh, people that are more than 65, but you see that centenarians are going to increase more than 1,000%. And this is not only going to happen in developed countries, but if you see from this graph, this is going to happen more into developing countries. By 2050, there will be a huge increase in the, in the aging population. But what is the problem with aging? Aging it can lead to specific pathologies, those pathologies are mainly degenerative disorders, 
we have cancer, we have muscle atrophy, osteoporosis, and we also have cardiac dysfunction. And why this is a problem? Because aging is socially very expensive. So there are more than 35 million that are 65, 65 years old, older today, that would double, there would be more than more people that I would be 85. And one in five of these people gets in a prescribed an appropriate medication. They use half of the physician time, they use half of the prescription medications, and they also use half of the hospital stays. So what is the problem with um, also why we study cardiac aging? Because cardiovascular disease, they increase progressively with aging together with many other conditions. And they're still like leading the, um, the cause of death in the, um, in, the, in the developed countries and also in the, it would be soon also in the, in the developing countries. So this is just like a very quick review how, how the heart works. The works basically is a, is, a, is a muscle or organ that basically what it does is pumps blood through the vessels to perfuse all the organism. It can be divided into a right side and the left side. The right side is responsible for the pulmonary circulation and the left side for the uh, systemic circulation. And basically it works by alternating uh, two phases that are um, happening synchronously and, uh, um, and are the, the, the contraction phase that is the systole and uh, when the, pump, the blood is expelled from the ventricles and the relaxation phase during which the ventricular uh, chambers are filled with, uh, with blood. So anything, the, any dysfunction that can happen uh, during the systole or the diastole or both uh, produces problems. And this is the concept of heart failure when basically the heart is not, uh, uh, is not more capable to keep up with the demands from the organism. And as I said, this can happen for a dysfunction of, uh, of both phases. If you see, this is a normal heart where the filling part of diastole is normal. Filling diast diastole is also an energetically active uh, uh, process, likewise uh, systole. In uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, what is affected is basically, is mainly the systolic phase. Basically, um, the heart is not able to maintain um, a, a regular, a normal, cardiac output because of reduced contractility of the ventricles. On the other hand, when the diastole is, main, is affected, what happens is basically that the ventricles are more rigid and what happens is that they don't fill properly. So less blood goes into the ventricles and eventually there is also less blood that is, uh, that is expelled. And uh, just to give you very because you, you have to see how it looks like. So this is this is a MRI a four chamber view through MRI imaging, and you can see this is the this is the left ventricle and this is the um, the left atrium. This is the, the focus on the on the left part of the heart. This is what happens basically when you have uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, you can appreciate together with this mitral regurgitation that basically during the systole, uh, it's way less evident the, uh, the propulsion of, the exp the, of, of blood from the, from the left ventricle. On the other hand, uh, when we have, uh, when we have uh, heart failure with, reduce, with the, um, with the um, preserve the ejection fraction, you see that the, that the heart is able to contract, but you, you can appreciate also that, uh, that the walls are thicker compared to normal, and there is some sort of rigidity in this, uh, in this process. So, how age, how aging can affect um, these two, this two uh, conditions? Basically, 
uh, aging is associated to a number of molecular uh, structural changes in the heart. And this may contribute to the fact that heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction is more frequent in the aging population. But heart failure with, pre with preserved ejection fraction uh, is also a multifactorial disease uh, where uh, while um, uh, the reason why aging is uh, associated with heart failure with the reduced ejection fraction is basically because increases the risk of having myocardial infarction that produces um, an important cardiomyocyte loss and because of the poor regenerative capacity of the heart, basically the net effect is the um, re reduction of the contractility of the heart. So, as I said, there are a number of specific changes uh, that are associated with uh, cardiac aging and can impact, um, can impact uh, the diastolic function. And it goes from mitochondrial dysfunction, cardiac hypertrophy, there is increased fibrosis, reduced uh, calcium handling uh, activity. And this mon mon some of these changes may be triggered by systemic changes uh, like inflammation that occurs with, with age. This both increase passive stiffness and they can impair uh, the active diastolic relaxation. So one of the major problems is that heart failure will preserve ejection fraction uh, in opposition to, to the other form of, uh, of heart, heart failure uh, really needs novel therapies because uh, to date there are no specific treatments for this condition. The mortality is equal to the other conditions. And while heart failure for, with reduced uh, ejection fraction has benefit of a number of novel therapeutic approaches, we're still very far from finding uh, something that's really affecting, can change the history of the disease. So, what are the animal models that can be used for, uh, to study? It is, as I said, this is a very, it is, uh, it is associated with aging. It's a multifactorial disease, so it's very hard to find uh, one animal model that can be used and can be, uh, and, and the finding can be easily translated into humans. So, as we said, aging is definitely associated to, to, to the disease. So, um, as being like a model of uh, this Fisher 344 rats have been proposed as a model. They develop diastolic uh, dysfunction. They also have uh, um, a mild form of uh, systolic function. But they mainly um, react by producing eccentric uh, hypertrophy while in uh, uh, HPF, its uh, concentric hypertrophy is more common. Another way of studying has been using some sort of mice with um, a senescent accelerated phenotype. They also exhibit for some form of, uh, of um, diastolic dysfunction. Or we can act uh, either pharmacologically by infusing aldosterone or angiotensin 2 that increase blood pressure, systemic, uh, that, um, uh, systolic and diastolic uh, blood pressure, and then develop um, some of the features that are associated with uh, HPF. Um, there are other forms where you basically, um, these, are, these are rats that are sensitive to to salt or the docker salt rat where you combine the nephrectomy with the, with the, um, with the um, um, supply of uh, water with 1% sodium chloride that I can assure you is very salty because I tried it when I was doing these experiments <laughs> with the rats, so it's really bad. And, uh, and you also give a mineral corticoid to those, uh, to those, um, to those animals. Or, but one of the most common use model is the transverse aortic constriction model, where basically you induce pressure overload. And this is basically commonly used in uh, many laboratories. Basically what you do, <clears throat> this is the anatomy of the, of the aorta. Here we have the ascending aorta, and here the aortic arch and the ascending aorta. This is the nominate artery that then goes to the uh, the, the right subclavian and the right uh, carotid artery, and this is the left uh, carotid, common carotid artery. Basically, what you do, you reduce the size of the aorta, this specific uh, site. So what happens is that you have an increase, you create a gradient here, 
is like, uh, and you increase the pressure here in this area. So in order to, um, uh, to um, expel enough blood for the requirement of the organism, the reaction of the heart is to um, uh, produce concentric hypertrophy. And what you see, if you take the heart from a sham animal and the attack animal, we can clearly see the difference in size. The thing is that, so you have a phase where there is, um, a, com com there is a compensation phase through hypertrophy of the remaining uh, cardiomyocytes, but eventually there is cardiac dysfunction that is not just diastolic but also systolic dysfunction, and you have a clear phase of heart failure with also um, uh, ventricular dil dil dilation. And uh, this is uh, associated to cardiomyocyte death, incre increase the position of, uh, of uh, fibrosis that can be either uh, interstitial than peri perivascular. And, uh, because, because of the presence of fibrosis, this impairs, that is more rigid compared to the muscular tissue, this impairs, um, this impairs uh, diastolic function. And this is just like a, a, a video to, to, that shows how this is performed. Basically, you have access to the um, chest cavity. It's kind of dark, but basically you localize uh, the aorta, and then what you do, you pass uh, a silk suture around, uh, around uh, the aorta between the nominate artery and the left carotid artery. Then you do basically a double knot, but without tying at this time. And then what you do, you take a, a 27G needle and you put it uh, on the side of the aorta. After that, you basically you tie both uh, knots, and what, and you immediately remove the remove the needle. What happens? The sides of the needle, it's going to be the new sides of the aorta. That is way smaller than what it was uh, than when it was before. And this is basically how it is um, how we perform these experiments. Okay. But another way of studying uh, um, aging, I mean, the best model of uh, aging is, an age, is a naturally aged mouse. That is way more expensive, very hard to find, but it's probably still the best model that can recapitulate, uh, recapitulate what happens with uh, human aging. So, <clears throat> um, the parabiosis, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this. This is a surgical technique where you basically, you can uh, um, conjoin two animals and you dis do this surgically. So they basically develop a shared circulation. And through this shared circulation, you can have a, a sharing of both cells and circulating factors. This is very effective. And because these animals are, um, are, are um, joined only through their common circulation is very effective in studying the effect of the circulating factors of tissue phenotypes. And just to give you like a quick example, the, um, this experiment was performed in the 70s and then that was very helpful to identify using these two forms of obese and diabetic mice, the OB mice and the uh, DB mice, uh, to find that one had the uh, mutation of the receptor of leptin and the other had the mutation uh, that um, and basically didn't have the circulating uh, uh, leptin. But we have performed also experiment to see whether uh, parabiosis could be effective uh, in uh, uh, modulating the cardiac aging phenotype. As I said before, cardiac aging is associated with cardiac hypertrophy. You can see here, this is the middle section of a young, unpaired mouse, and this is the, the middle section of a, an old mouse. You can appreciate the difference in size. <clears throat> we join uh, two animals together at the same age. This is called uh, isochronic uh, um, parabiosis. 
or two old animals. And then we join together an old animal with a young animal. And uh, you can see that the heart of the two conjoined animals stay bigger like, like the old one. But what happened to the old animal, to the heart of the old animal that was joined to the young mouse, we found that basically the size was significantly reduced and this was like found at also at the cell, at the, a cellular course at the cellular level. And uh, this is interesting that if you perform sham how, how long? 24, 28 days, it was four weeks. One month was enough? It was one month, yes. Is one month of uh, most of those parabiosis experiments have been have been done for uh, for a month. So, because I didn't really believe of what I what I found, I decided to test whether or not uh, this was true. Sorry, did you perform also an experiment uh, uh, with uh, like uh, to quantify this change in terms of days, or you just did no? We did uh, we did uh, no we didn't. We were not even expecting that before uh, four weeks could even see something. Mm -hmm. no, so, but, it, but we had to do the experiment to see how long it lasts. That's probably even more interesting. Once you remove the young animal, if you have changed something that is stable in time or like you, you gain back the phenotype. And also you mentioned, uh, what is the, uh, the, the age for young animals? Oh, sorry. So we um, we use two months old uh, uh, for the for the young animals, uh, twenty four months old for the for the for the the old uh, mice. The thing is that uh, mice can live longer, up to like thirty two months or something like that. The problem is that after twenty four months, they start developing tumors and a lot of problems. It's really really hard to perform many, but. A 24 months old mouse is like an 80 years old human, kind of. So, I mean, I think still. Uh, Sorry, another question related to this one. Uh, to the young animal, there, is no, there are no changes in the shape of the heart, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just that the old one is ha has benefits. Uh, on yes, the because, man, I mean, what you could have, you know, we, we could have had also that the heart was getting getting bigger like this, right? So it could have been the opposite. And there are actually some studies, especially where they have performed um, parabiosis between a young and old animal, that together with an improvement of cognitive function in the old mouse, you also could see like a, um, um, a reduction in the cognitive uh, function of the of the young uh, of the young animal. This could this could go both ways. But in this case, we did not see any significant change in the heart, also at, the, at, the, at the, a molecular level. Okay, excuse me. Let's go to, to do this experiment uh, with two young together. We stayed one with the one young one old. Mm -hmm. But uh, as you said, you know, you know two young uh, together? These are the two young. Two young yeah, we did two young together, a young and an old, and, an, and two old together. These are all the experimental groups of the, of the study. As I said, since I was not believing in, because I mean, parabiosis is associated to change, change behavioral changes, you know, those animals eat less, sleep less, or anyway, this changes everything, right? So it's, can, it can be a problem when you deal with this. So I decided to do this sham parabiosis, was basically join those mice together but without joining the skin, so there was no cross circulation among them. So they only shared the difference, the behavioral differences. And you can see here that in the old heterochronic sham, there was no difference compared with the old uh, isochronic sham. But this effect was going beyond the, 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 the cardiac tissue. We also had evidence of a sort of rejuvenation, rejuvenative effect, both in skeletal muscle and uh, in, uh, in, uh, in brain tissue. And this together with other um, findings that were published like simultaneously at Stanford, these people decided to test the effect of uh, human young plasma that was given to patients with Alzheimer's disease to see whether or not there was a there was, a, there was an effect. And they enrolled only 
20 patients so far and they have preliminary data that is safe, that is uh, safety, tolerable, it's feasible. Plasma is commonly used uh, as, a, as a treatment, so th this is why it went really fast. <clears throat> but it's still very early to see if it's safe, this, this is going to be effective. But if you just perform a search on clinical trials, you will see these are all the human clinical trials. They're mainly in, um, in, um, involved in uh, patients with neurological neurodegenerative disorders, where basically they're testing the effect of, uh, of, young, uh, of young plasma. But I have to say there is also another one that's called Ambrosia, where basically uh, you have to pay to be enrolled in this trial. You pay $8,000 to be enrolled, and basically they give you plasma, young plasma, and then measure biomarkers associated with aging. That is the claim, but it's a clear like scam, and it's basically a way to make money with the rich people in uh, North America that can that want to pay $8,000 dollars for that. Another interesting finding where parabiosis can be used as an approach is something that recently has been found. Basically, you think of Alzheimer's disease of a, a disease of the brain, where um, beta amyloid accumulates one of the characteristics, accumulation of beta amyloids in, the, in brain tissue. Recent evidence have shown that a patient with Alzheimer's disease also developed diastolic dysfunction, and they have found beta amyloid in the myocardial tissue. But uh, the thing is that it's not clear whether this is coming from the brain through a metast metastatic pathway, or this produced locally in the heart in a sort of systemic disease. So one way of actually uh, testing this is by performing parabiosis between wild-type mice and mice that have uh, Alzheimer's disease with uh, human uh, mutations. And this is what we're going to perform here together with other experiments. So this is the part regarding the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. I'll try to go like very quickly on the other parts. Like I said, that, as I said before, aging affects also um, the ability of the heart to contract properly affects the systolic function, mainly because it uh, increases the risk of, uh, the risk of myocardial impaction. It, it, so the loss of uh, the massive loss of cardiomyocytes. The problem with, uh, with cardiomyocytes is that um, most of cardiomyocytes are produced at the, um, like perinatally, and um, the you know there's been sort of debate whether or not these cells can replicate, cannot replicate, there are like stem cells residing in the heart, there's been a huge debate. What is known today is probably cardiomyocytes can have the ability and the capacity to divide at a very, very low level, and it's happening starting from pre-existing cardiomyocytes. And taking advantage of the atmospheric uh, uh, nuclear exposure, explosions were performed during the during the, um, the 50s and the 60s. Basically, what happened? There was a, a pulse of uh, carbon 14 in the atmosphere that was like uh, fixed by the plants, and then every organism had that specific amount of of, uh, of uh, carbon 14, depending on where it was born. But then, because of the ban of the, of the nuclear explosion, there was a rapid decline in C14. So by measuring how much C14 is found after an X number of years, you can uh, kind of find how many times there's been a cellular division. Based on that, basically, you can see that cardiomyocyte turnover is about 1% per year when you are age 20, but then it declined to 0.3% per year at age 75, um, the heart gets bigger with aging, but it's getting bigger mainly because it, it becomes hypertrophic, not because there is an increase in the number. That actually declines with age. And you will see that at age 75, six, about 60, 65 of the cardiomyocytes, uh, when you are 75, are, the, are cardiomyocytes that are 75 years old. Okay, but they're still able to, to contract. So 
Uh, in lower vertebrates, what happens when you have an injury in the a cardiac injury that you have a full regeneration? In mammals, this ability is quickly lost after birth. Um, uh, re the replenishment of the cardiomyocyte loss is by scar formation, except for, at least in rodents, for a very short window that happens usually during the first seven days. And during these seven days, basically, you can have um, almost complete um, 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 repair by cardiomyocyte replenishment. When you go, when you do this after uh, day seven, and especially in the, in the adult, you have basically scar formation. And there are like many theories that can explain, they are trying to explain why this is happening. So, but why this is, this is very important. The, the ability of the heart, the, 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 loss, the, lo, the cap, low capacity of the heart to regenerate. When you see a patient with this, and if you're not quick enough, this is what happens this is what you have, this is the right coronary artery, this is kind of normal. What you see, this is the left coronary artery, and what happens if you're very quick in the cath lab, you see there is something here, it's gonna be clear. You see here, this is the left anterior descending uh, that basically perfuse the left ventricle. And what you see is that what the best way to treat myocardial infarction is to be very rapid, very effective by mechanically uh, disobstructing the occlusion by removing the, the, the thrombus and mechanically stretching the wall together with uh, drugs that can interfere with the clotting process. The problem is that this doesn't happen all the time that often, and most of the times it happens late, and when it's too late, basically you have all this area that's basically replenished by, replenished by a scar. <coughs> And uh, the repair by scarring produces dilatation and failure that happens with chronic remodeling. So we have been so far very effective in this phase to, to treat the early complication of, uh, of myocardial infarction, but still we're far away from solving the problem we are when we are at this stage because basically with the, because of the poor capa regenerative capacity of the heart. In order to study that, as I said, we have, uh, um, as I said, in the first seven days, um, the heart is able to, to regenerate almost completely. And basically, <clears throat> this is important because basically you can, uh, you can study the mechanism, how you can interfere with this process, right? And the way you can do to um, the animal model that I used are basically two, the apical resection, where you basically surgically remove the apex of the, of the heart, or you can actually, or you can perform uh, the ligature of the left uh, uh, descending uh, uh, coronary artery, and basically you block, um, uh, you block the perfusion to the anterior wall of the, of the left ventricle. So what happens in, uh, in neonates, that basically you have, this is, this is the, actually, this is referred to, to, the, to, the, to the apical resection. You see that almost uh, at, um, at day 21, you, you won't see any more any scar, but you see like um, um, card cardiomyocyte, new cardiomyocyte that have, been, have, have formed in that area. If you instead perform the same experiment in an adult mouse, you can appreciate here the discoloration of the area after the ligature of the uh, left, or left anterior descending artery. And what happens over time is that skeletal muscle uh, tissue is substituted by scar. And you can imagine that scar is only passive in the, contra in the contraction process. And just to finish, because we're getting close to lunch time, I will show you just like a quick video how this surgery is performed. This is the left anterior descending artery that you can visualize, not all the time, but you can see the tip of the, of the left atrium. 
you can put a suture around here. You can see that the needle has to go under the LED. And then there are two ways of doing it, this. You can stop um, the um, flow only for a certain period of time and do an ischemia reperfusion uh, model, or you can do permanent ligation. And um, this is one way, you know, you put like this um, plastic tube in between and then you tie and then you basically, when you release it, you have the reperfusion that can produce, produce the damage. Or you can permanently like it the artery, and you will see that there is blanching of the area, and there is also this kinesia of this, of this area that will basically will be over time substituted, you see the change in the color, and will be substituted by, by a scar. And um, basically these are the two models that are commonly used nowadays in, the, in most of the labs. And with this, I finish, I take questions. Thank you.